I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast. Rob, today we have a special guest on the podcast, Professor Carolyn Brown. Welcome, Professor Brown. You've written a book on Lu Xun. You've worked at the Library of Congress. Could you, could you tell us a little bit about your journey to, to this point? Yeah, well, the journey starts, um, my journey with Lu Xun starts uh, as an undergraduate when I first read um, one of his stories in a Chinese lit and translation course. Um, it was the New Year's Sacrifice. And when I got to the end of that story, I felt like I'd been punched in the gut. And I thought, like, what? what? What's happening here? Because at that point, I didn't know all that much about China. I was reading in translation. And no story I had ever encountered up to that point. And I'd done a lot of reading in Western literature at that point. Uh, no story had ever had that impact on me. Um, and I couldn't understand it then. And I had to understand it. It was one of those things you have to do before you die. So I was in academia for a number of years. I got out of academia, went to the Library of Congress, did a lot of interesting things, including heading a research center. But in the back of my mind, I still had to write the book that answered the question. Um, so eventually I did, and it came out, 2018, reading Lu Xun through Carl Jung. Um, and I should say Carl Jung got in there because to answer the question about the impact, I had to really turn to psychology, um, the usual discussion in terms of Chinese history and intellectual history. It was all very interesting, but it didn't explain why the story had had that impact on me. So um, I used Carl Jung to name what I was seeing in the stories, um, not to talk about influence. People always talk about literary influence. It wasn't that. It was to have a credible psychological vocabulary with which to talk about the stories. So I'd be correct then in saying that first you were blown away by Lu Xun, and then after a very long time, you found Carl Jung a useful resource for helping to explain that. But it wasn't that you were just super interested in Carl Jung and went, oh, Lu Xun would be a good place to explore that. Correct. I got interested in, in uh, Carl Jung for a whole lot of personal reasons. So at a certain point, I realized that Jung's work could help me explain what I was seeing in Lu Xun, but two different avenues. And you've got a really wonderful phrase in the introduction to that book, where you effectively say, you know, Lu Xun has said in the introduction to Nahan and other places, he was trying to diagnose a problem. One of your interesting interventions there is, okay, but how come no one's ever really bothered to explain what the problem is, like the psychological problem? What, what exactly was he talking about? Like you say, it's, it's kind of easy to just go, well, China was suffering and he was trying to you know, do something about that. But I'm curious though, before we get to the story, have you encountered any kind of resistance from people like longtime Lu Xun scholars, people in the China field, like there have you found people pretty receptive? Um, well, I would say I haven't, but if you look at my biography uh, carefully, you'll see that essentially I left the field in 1990 and went into um, a managerial role at the Library of Congress. And when I left that, I went to a role in a uh, foundation, interestingly enough, still dealing with some of the issues that I had uncovered in uh, Lu Xun's work. So other than reading some of the reviews, which so far have been kind, um, I don't really know how the book has been received. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably the best way to do it. At, at the very least, uh, we talked to Professor Chan and he had uh, a lot of high praise for, for you. So I think that, you know, experts are are reading it and dealing with your work and enjoying the new perspective that you bring. So I, I think that says a lot. And I, I and should it, say, you know, on the back of the book, there are endorsements by various China scholars who had read it and liked it, Eva Shanjo and uh, Jan Koalas. So somebody likes it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's wonderful to be able to talk with someone about a project like this, where it is, this is not a CV maker. This is not your tenure track book. This is... Right this is the book you just want to write. And it's rare to find that in academia. So it's, it's, it's really refreshing. Yeah. It's interesting also because so many of those tenure makers tend to be saying 
kind of what they need to to get tenure, whereas it, it feels much more like you were ad- addressing these personal questions that that had I don't know if the right word has haunted you for three decades or four decades, but, but, you know, it had resonated over that period. And, and that, that definitely comes across. Yeah, no, that's fair. Haunted is probably a good word. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of haunted, should we turn to soap? So let's actually real quick ask uh, Professor Brown, why this story? Lucian wrote a ton of stuff. There's any number of things we could have talked about that are haunting, strange, that escape uh, analysis. Why soap? And then we'll kind of get into what the plot is and really discuss it. Yeah, well, I think soap is self-contained and it's fairly simple in a way. It's very well-crafted, so I don't mean it's simple-minded, but it's extremely well-crafted and you can talk about uh, soap without having to go back to the larger issues I raised in the book about Carl Jung and psychology, et cetera. You can just see it as a, I think of it as Lucian musing about some of the major issues of his time that have been brought up, the place of women in society, reflections on his, um, on the discourse about A Doll's House by Henrik Ibsen. And it seems like a clear answer to some of those issues. Uh, So it's easy to talk about in a short period of time. Professor Brown, would you like to summarize the story very quickly? And then we can kind of dive into some stuff to talk about. Yeah. Okay. Basically, it's a story of a man coming home. He gives his wife a special gift of foreign soap. Uh, She's very pleased. Uh, It's unexpected. Then he begins talking about how he happened to buy this piece, this bar of soap, very unusual. Um, the fact that some school children on the street have called him some name in English, and he knows it's a bad word, but he doesn't know what it is. So he demands that his son, who is studying English, try to explain it to him. And you watch as, as that unfolds. And he did also describes having encountered a young beggar girl on the street who was very filial. As the evening proceeds... Uh, his wife comes to understand, and this is where the story is so subtle, that in buying her the soap, he was actually thinking about this young beggar woman. At that point, uh, some of his friends come, I should say, he's a very old-fashioned thinking person. And so it's his friends from a moral uh, rearmament league, and they want to write a, a poem in praise of this filial maid that they've all seen on the street, et cetera, et cetera. And they do and agree to publish it in a magazine. Meanwhile, however, just before his friends have arrived, he and his wife had had a confrontation around the meeting of this bar of soap. And so you see him afraid to (laughs) go back in the house after his friends have come. Um, But the next morning, the issues have been resolved and she uses the soap. Such a wonderful, (laughs) such a wonderful ending because... It's not the ending you're really expecting. So, Professor Brown, I, I was interested in hearing your perspective on uh, the, the role of gender in this story. And one thing that stood out to me is we never, as far as I know, learned Suming's wife's name. The story starts out, Suming, Tai Tai. Those are the first words in right. the Chinese. But even though she's kind of foregrounded there, right there in that first that first sentence, Suming being the, we should mention the, the name of the protagonist, even though we... we have her foregrounded we never learn her name and so there's this question she she's a an incredibly important role and but what agency does she have in the story so part of what's interesting is that in her roles and in her name she's a very traditional uh woman who is not supposed to have any agency of her own (laughs) Um, And just as the husband is very traditional in the narrow patriarchal sense, it appears that you would expect that she will be as well. And part of what I love about the story um, is that even though she has only the domestic space uh, within which to, you know, live her life, she is indeed an agent, and she's the prominent person in the story. Uh, And she's the one who, in fact, drives the action, uh, which is not what you're thinking. 
one of the things I, I guess I like about this story, if you think of the the context and the discussion, um, both in popular literature and intellectual literature of China at the time, was what is the appropriate role of women? And there's the old, you know, traditional modern discourse and the older good woman as in filial <laughs> or uh, a maternal woman versus a uh, bad woman who's anyone who kind of breaks up the norms with their passion of some kind, whether it's sexual or whatever. And into that kind of discourse, it's as if Lu Xun were to say, well, what would a real woman do? And I think of this story as an answer to um, that essay he wrote, what, one answer to that essay, what happens if the Chinese Nora leaves home? And there's that, that uh, story, Regret for the Past or In Memoriam, that looks at what, what happens um, if a Chinese Nora leaves home. This is kind of a story about what happens if Nora doesn't leave home. Hmm. Um, because in the course of the story, Mrs. Uh, Suning, Suning's wife understands, comes to understand that her husband's sexual attention has been interest, her husband's sexual interest is focused on this young beggar woman. And he's cloud, he's dressed it in Confucian language of the filial maid, filial piety. Uh, but she figures this out and she is furious. Um, and what you see in the story, and this is the subtlety of it. First, when her husband comes in, she ignores him. He gives her a bar of soap. She is very, very pleased as he tries to address the child, instead of being indifferent, which he seemed to be when he came home, she starts helping him and she also calls the child. And when he voices negative opinions, she kind of, you know, goes along initially. But as he tells his story, she goes from being supportive of him to being silent, to actually leaving the room while he's still talking. Um, so you can see that she is understanding his story in a way that he himself doesn't understand the story he's telling. Um, and this really gets into the, the psychological aspect that you talk about in, in your book, because there's something being repressed. He's saying something that he himself probably doesn't really understand, but his wife does. And that I, I love the way you put that about um, the Nora from uh, from Ibsen. What would happen if she stayed? Right, having a, having been awakened in this way, what would happen if she didn't walk out the door and turned around? Right, and Lucian does such. You, you're right, such a wonderful slow burn. Right, you, you don't see the explosion coming until you go back and reread the story, and you go, "Oh, interesting." She just walked out of the room. Uh, do you see that as her recovering her agency? over the course of the story or did it, was it always there to begin with? And she's just sort of letting it out. Yeah. I think it was always there. I think the fact that she ignores him when he first comes home until he gives her the soap. Um, and Lucian is very clear that she hears him coming, but she doesn't respond until he's right next to her chair. <laughs> yeah. So, so she already, she pretty much has the story down to begin with. Another telling detail that I just totally love is even though she's figured this all out, she doesn't say anything until at the dinner table, he goes after the son. Mm. Okay. So when, and he's, she's intervened a little bit before earlier in the story, but more, more gently. Um, but when he goes after the child, for having taken the piece of meat, <laughs> or I think it's a piece of cabbage, whatever it is. Yeah, cabbage heart, I think. is Cabbage, it? okay. She comes out of left field and just slams him, slams the husband. And he doesn't know what hit him. But the other thing that you can see happening is that the child who's been told to, the young man, son, who's been told to come up with a translation, figures out what the translation is for what his father's been called. And he's not about to tell his father that he's been called an old fool. No kid would. Not it's a smart kid. A, That's a smart kid right there. He, right. He's not about <laughs> to. 
<laughs> anything else, but he's not about to do that. So you can see that, you know, um, that unfolding, which is just so, it's just so delicately done. So I, I mean, I see the story as, in a way, Lucian blowing up all of these tropes about what a woman is supposed to be. And then he turns it on its head, reuses them. So one of the things Mrs. Something says in her outrage, uh, she finally comes to the conclusion, she says, we women are more, um, I forget exact words, more moral and more upstanding than you men, which of course is what filial women are supposed to be, but she's redefined the nature of what it means to be truly moral. And it's something along the line of speaking truth to power and being genuinely moral and deeply human in your morality. So I love that. Um, And in fact, speaking the truth that those in power don't see themselves, which is an even more subtle move. Right. And I see her as actually totally akin to the madman in Madman's Diary. Um, Now, she's not reading Confucian classics, so she can't say these classics are all about eating people, right? Which the madman says. But it's like she reads the morality of, she reads the text of the situation. Literary people call it the performative text. She Hmm. rereads the performative text through a new, different um, lens of morality. Um, And she sees that the talk about the filial maid uh, and she asked, did anyone give her any money? No. <laughs> she rereads that text and says what it's really about, which is her husband and these men are looking at a young woman. They're thinking about scrubbing her up with soap, which means they're thinking of her as actually as naked. And they're pretending it's high minded. Um, yeah. so she's really just like the madman. It's just that her sphere is domestic. So she can't do it in a great societal kind of way. Right. But I just love that. Mm. One question I had is there seems to be an irony that you're, you're touching on, right? That even though she doesn't have this kind of wider vision that, that maybe intellectual training would give her, but uh, Suming has that training. He is adept in the Confucian classics, and yet he completely misses that. So is, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm intrigued by your, your comparison of her to the madman because uh, it almost seems like the Confucian training that he has had is actually blinding him to the truth. Is that reasonable? Yeah, that's one way of, of reading it. Another way of reading it, and this verges into the Jungian way, but another way of reading it is that the people in society who have the least power, um, and it's whether it's the women or the, the really poor people or whatever, and this seems to be pretty universal. The people at the bottom see the people at the top with much greater clarity than the people at the top see themselves. Um, so I, I would tend to um, univer- almost universalize that uh, that pattern here, but it's also very particular to uh, the uh, what you suggest that the con- people trained in Confucianism can see the real meaning of Confucianism. I'm sort of reminded too about the Zhang Pu novel "Flowers on a Sea of Sin," where you effectively have a Confucian scholar traveling with his mistress or his concubine and his Confucian training makes him woefully unprepared for anything outside of books, but his concubine who's not educated in that understands everything else. She's the one who speaks German. She's the one who sort of saves them time and time again from all of their terrible adventures. So there's a little bit of a standard here, but again, as you point out, this is all happening inside the home as opposed to roaming the world. And that, that change in venue changes everything. It's fascinating. Yeah, the venue changes everything, but the pattern, and, and this is why I think a psychological reading, um, in addition to the others, is helpful. The pattern doesn't change. Um, and uh, that's why it's useful to think in terms of tropes and I'll use a Jungian word, archetypes or myth in the sense of stories that are deeply true 
that's why it's useful to use those kinds of lenses so that you're not, I don't want to say blinded, but so that you see the particulars as well as the deep patterns. Hmm. You want to see it all, not just a yeah. part. Um, so I want to throw this in because we've been talking about Su Ming's wife, who unfortunately has never given a name. I want to talk for just a second about Su Ming himself because Lu Xun loves his clowns, right? He's got the madman. He's got a Q. He's got numerous others in his stories who sort of play the, almost the Shakespearean fool, right? They're, they're kind of ridiculous characters, but they're, they're there to be ridiculous, to point out something we wouldn't see otherwise. Are we meant to see Su Ming as kind of a clown or are we meant to be very sympathetic to him? In a way, he's both because he changes in the course of the story. And you don't see it till the, the, the very end. But so he, he comes in with his sort of rigid Confucian, old fashioned, you could use the word, you know, clownish way of being. And even with his friends, he keeps that persona. But you can see it's begun to crack because when they start laughing about scrubbing up this, you know, beggar woman, he says sort of, shh. You know, don't talk so loudly. My wife is going to hear you. Shut up, shut up. Exactly. <laughs> so he's already feeling chastised. You know, exactly what's going through his mind, you don't really know. But he's, he's already feeling chastised. What you see at the end is, right, that swimming has changed. Initially, his wife has been using, um, I can't remember, some kind of pods to clean her neck. And that doesn't work very well. At the end, after this hubbub has taken place she agrees she just starts using the new soap that he's brought her um and the narrator using coded language talks about this being the difference between heaven and hell and you get the impression first that something has redirected his sexual attention to his wife and it's actually probably working better for him the implication is that they've made love and it's actually better for him. And how do you know that? At the very end, sandalwood soap appears. And I always wondered about uh, sandalwood with, with soap. Um, and with the help of um, a wonderful research assistant, uh, Du Xiaoye, she tracked down for me an article indicating that sandalwood soap was regarded as extremely expensive. So Sun so Ming has moved from giving his wife good foreign soap to the finest foreign soap. So he's changed. So he's, you know, I'm sure he still talks about moral rearmament and filial, well, he doesn't talk about them, but <laughs> think some of his old fashioned thoughts, probably there's no suggestion that he doesn't, but at least within the domestic sphere, he's heard his wife, He's changed and it's just beautiful. It's fascinating because we, when we, I mean, the approach to Lu Shoot is always one of he's the revolutionary, he's the one who's speaking truth to power, he's trying to sort of change the order of things. But depending on how you read the story, it's almost one of reconciliation, not necessarily between the old and the new, but something is happening here where husband and wife. The, the 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 sort of the Nora of the story, the the woman who's awakened and understands how things really are, and the husband who's a part of having made the things the way they are, seem to be, if not on the same page, at least reconciled. And that's not necessarily the ending I would expect from Lu Xun. Yeah, well, I think you have to read, and this is why I like reading the stories as a whole from a Jungian framework. Um, the argument that uh, Lu Shun, using a medical metaphor, said he wanted to change or heal the spirits of the Chinese people. And so the tradition has been to, that is the tradition of scholarship, has been to ask what did he see as the illness and what was the cause of the illness? My question had been, well, if he thought he could change the spirits, did he have, in addition to a notion of the, the, the definition and the cause, did he also have a vision of what the therapeutic process would be and even a vision of the healed state? And within SOAP, you have that whole transition. He does have a vision of the process and he does have a vision 
of the healed state. And it's not only there, it's hinted in A Bad Man's Diary. Lucian, even though he was anti-Confucian, was also trained in Confucianism. And so his natural assumption would be that the dynamics that govern the individual, the family, the community, and the state would be in alignment. So when I looked at the stories as a body through the work of Carl Jung, I could see him testing that, starting at the national level, which is kind of where madman goes, the community level, the family level, and the um, inner level, which you see in the story of um, Brothers. And his conclusion, which, again, I, I tried to document by going through the text, is at the level of nation and community, there would be no healing. At the level of family, there might be, or there might not be. And that was also possible at the level of the inner state. And he really worked that through of the body of stories. And part of why I think, personally think he stopped writing short stories, which of course is one of the big issues with Lu Xun, um, is he wrote his way to his conclusion. It's coded, but he came to that conclusion. And the natural outcome of that conclusion is you really have to have a revolution to heal the community and the nation. So I just think that vision, the vision is there in, in soap of what, what a healed relationship would look like. It's not very dramatic. It's very subtle, um, but it's a lot better than it had been. Professor Brown, as, as we start to wrap up, I, I, I don't know if this is too juvenile of a question, but it almost seems like you're suggesting this, this ending of, of soap is a happy ending. And that's something that I don't really see that much in Lu Xun's other stories. Do you, would you agree? Is this a happy, like, does the story end on a good point? It's happy within its sphere. And there are other stories of, of um, healing. You see it in Brothers, where, you know, at the, at the end, where the older brother recognizes his own, it's not his own evil, it's his own selfishness. Um, and recognizing it, he's a little more compassionate to other people. And it's very subtle. It's not, you know, it's not big. But on the other hand, if you could imagine a world where everybody was a little more compassionate <laughs> to other people, it would really be a very different world if that were generalized. Rob, do you have any other questions or should we... I could talk to Professor Brown for another three and a half hours, but we only have a short podcast. So I think she, she did an admirable job there of, of finding a good place to wrap up because Lu Xun's stories, you can read them again and again and again, and you try to nail them down and it just escapes being nailed down, which is why we keep reading them. Exactly. I think it's really, um, truly great art. And I'll just say one more thing. For all of the capacity to see the patterns in the stories and in some way generalize them, which is what happens with Jung, if you use a Jungian framework, they're also so very particular to their time and place. And there's a way in which Lu Xun has totally taken in all the currents of his own time and place and found a way to express them through um, through a body of short stories. And it's quite remarkable. Not all the stories are that good, and they're, you know, missteps, and some of them are a little boring, but the great ones are just phenomenal. I think, I think that's a great place to end it. Professor Brown, thank you for elucidating the story that, that I don't think gets read enough. I think you've made it pretty clear that this is a story that needs to be taught more, that needs to be discussed more. I've had a great time. Rob, do you have any, anything? Nope. I'm just going to echo you and thank Professor Brown for being in on the discussion. This is part of a series where we are doing exactly what Professor, or trying to do exactly what Professor Brown did with a lot more eloquence than we're capable of, which is to say <laughs> Lu Xun is, is both very much a Chinese writer and very much more than a chi just a Chinese writer. So thank you so much, Professor Brown, for contributing to that. Great. Thank you. It's been fun. All right. Well, I think we'll end it there. I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast.